Okay. This is the second presentation about disasters. But, uh, this time is uh, external hazards. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to explain in this um, presentation first, general things about the external hazards, what they are, which kind of external hazards, what are the important aspects. There are many hazards. I cannot talk about all of them, and I also am not an expert in external hazards. And I don't think there is a person who can claim is an expert in all external hazards. This is not practically possible. Entails knowledge of many disciplines. So I'm going to be <coughs> saying something, concentrating on examples, not in details, about the most uh, important uh, topics. One is earthquake associated to earthquake and tsunami. It has been also important in the recent history in nuclear power plants. Uh, of course, I will relate this to a bit to, to the uh, standards that we have at the IEA. Uh, I will say something about, in general, about seismic evaluation methods. And then I'm going to be, and then the end of the presentation, I'm going to be more, I don't know, um, deductive or I don't know how to call it. It's to talk about a bit uh, recent experience uh, from the uh, earthquakes from external hazards in nuclear power plants and less of that can, can be learned and what the, the agency has been doing. That's the idea, I says how I try to occupy the, the, the time of the presentation. So, first, <coughs> recapitulating, also linking with the previous uh, presentation, the external hazards originate from sources that are outside of the plant. Can be near the plant, mostly are near the plant if you are talking uh, heavy uh, weather conditions and so on. But even remote, like a tsunami, can be taking, uh, can be originated by an earthquake very far from the plant. But anyway, it's something that it is coming from outside uh, the, the, the plant. And they have the capacity, of course, to fail uh, or uh, equipment at the plant, equipment important to safety, induce PIEs, and so on. So, I put here a list of uh, some uh, common external hazards, but there are many, many, many. Uh, the question is, not all the external hazards affect all the plants. Some of them are weather related, like, uh, I don't know, heavy snow or sandstorms or uh, so on. So, not all of them apply to all nuclear power plant sites. So, the first thing in the, when considering external hazards is a screening from maybe a very long list of hazards that have been identified, saying what is important, what is not important, what can happen, what can not. And we're going to be talking also about the, this screening process on the, at the high level. Because for the, for the internal hazards, we know what they are, they can happen at the plant. For the external, they happen outside. Sometimes you can screw them, sometimes not, like the like the um, uh, earthquakes, but those that you need to retain, you need to know about the frequency, about the magnitude, and you have to be able to decide whether you can put the plant in this site. So the analysis of external hazards uh, goes at the first in the suitability of the site, the site is suitable, then for the definition of the magnitude of the hazard that can be expected to us. This is an input for the design. This is an input for establishing the layout, and this is an input for establishing the design of the equipment against the hazard. So, this is, uh, will come, this is the list of uh, some list, examples of common hazards in nuclear power plants. Um, sometimes uh, people think uh, this cannot happen in my plant, like a tornado. This is something happening in the US. Things like that. It's not always true. Even uh, tornadoes have been seen recently in Europe, in Spain, and from Spain. So, good. Um, external hazards are important, among other reasons, because they can be a dominant contribution to the to the risk to the uh, risk of the of the plant to cause damage to significant uh, radiological release. So they cannot be. Ex 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 Excluded. Sometimes the estimation of these uh, risks are very often are associated with high uncertainties. But uh, 
they are very often important contributions. Sometimes what happens is that uh, we are very uncertain about the probability or the frequency of uh, such a hazard. And uh, the less or, or the stronger is the hazard, the stronger is the earthquake, for instance, of course, the lower is the frequency. And when the frequency is low, the uncertainty associated with this estimation of the frequency is high. So, but imagine, for instance, that uh, you want to have to consider <coughs> strong earthquake, which is in the order of a uh, magnitude of uh, that it can happen here, one in ten million years. Well, we don't have this uh, seismic story, uh, history. The question is how you. Uh, make such an estimate based on the records that uh, uh, you have from maybe the last 15 or 100 years when there was uh, reliable seismological uh, uh, equipment and registers and so on, the analysis of the ground, the fact, how you, how you do that. But also a point I think is interesting to make is that when we talk about earthquakes and things like that, uh, we are treating as random events that are not random. This happens also in the PSA. You, for instance, if I say that uh, the, the water boils at 100 degrees, everybody will agree. I mean, okay. yeah. uh, so that's not random. Uh, sometimes, uh, if I say a probability that the component fails or this light fails in the next 24 hours, maybe it's not random, but I cannot analyze then uh, what are the reasons that may make this fail right now, what is the condition of the lamp, what the, the, um. So sometimes we take as random things that are not random. Maybe something purely random is the disintegration of an atom when the radioactive atom particle is going to split. Yeah? So, and this happens with the earthquake. We take things as random that are maybe not random. So if you have a, a, an accident like the one in Fukushima uh, four years ago, where this plates collide together one way or the other. So now it will take many, many years until this tension will build up again and another earthquake of the same characteristic will happen there. So we cannot say that this is really random and, uh, the, and we are taking frequencies that are not, you know, based on occurrence on a period of years, but the, the events are not really random. So, but this is a, <coughs> a difficult topic. I will not go into you now these details of the frequency. The, the point is always the same. Uh, the, the, earth, the, 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 the external hazards have uh, a potential to um, affect uh, many components of the plan, or even the entire plan, create a load at least, shake the whole plan as the earthquake. And, uh, and the uncertainty regarding the, <coughs> the occurrence is, is, is high. Now, the, the phenomena, losing my voice, um, is very diverse, it's very broad, and uh, it needs really <coughs> a whole team of uh, experts of many disciplines. You just look at the list. So you need uh, people that know from uh, science of the earth, I don't know how to call it, seismology, scale tectonics, you need person that you know about aircraft crash, resistance of structures, and so on. So it's a... Uh, <coughs> There are many topics, uh, and I'm not an expert in any of those areas. My, my, my uh, expertise in the area of hazard is limited to internal fires and uh, into, into flooding. And I know some limited knowledge. I have some limited knowledge about those areas, but that's it. So I'm telling you from my general knowledge in this presentation, but not uh, from uh, my personal experience in many of them. One interesting thing to consider about this external phenomena is that <coughs> even if they don't cause additional damage to the plant because the magnitude is not uh, very big, one thing they do is they very often contribute to the frequency of a uh, PIE, of the loss of offset power. So imagine these heavy storms or uh, rains and so on. Very often they fail the grid and nothing more happens to the plant. But at the end, this PIE becomes of high frequency. This depends also on the country, how strong is the net, the interconnection, and so on. But there are uh, countries in which there may be experienced a lot of offside power 
several times per year. So, and then the emergency power supply has to react, and so it's a challenge to a safety system. So that's a point to take into account, that even if no damage <coughs> is caused, also some hazards contribute to increase this frequency of PAs. That's a picture of uh, Kasikasawi Kariba nuka power plant, largest plant in the world, where there was a very strong earthquake that caused some secondary effects, like a fire. This is a fire of a transformer. And we'll talk a bit about uh, earthquakes today. The other one, <coughs> tsunami. And this is a picture of a plant that you know very well. You see in this picture, there are many pictures when the, the wave hits the plant. And it's interesting to know that it's not only the, the high of the way that it is coming, the, the sea is going up, it's also the run up. When the, when the wave hits the plant, it hits with force. Sometimes it carries things with it, vehicles, cars, and everything. And it's the run up, and the, so the, 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 this uh, top of the wave goes up into the, to the hill. So, so you think the water is going to come only this high. In reality, it goes much higher because it flashes up. Uh, now, <clears throat> what we have at the IEA for standards, we have two kinds of standards. We have requirements for siting and requirements associated to the siting, to the site evaluation for external hazards. So when you do the siting, the site siting is a site selection and site evaluation. You have to take into account many factors for the site. Some of them are safety related, some of them are not safety related. For instance, you need to have a grid. Yeah? Some of them are economic aspects. Uh, seismic analysis or seismic is, of course, among the safety related uh, aspects. And it's very clearly indicated in the, in the in the seismic requirements. And we have the conditions to look for, uh, make a seismological, geological, geotechnical evaluation. You have to collect information, not only historical, but uh, prehistorical. Value seismology, try to see what are the, the ex what experience you can gain about uh, seismic phenomena in the site or near the site. Uh, you need to develop a seismotectonic uh, model. Uh, there is a need to, to uh, for uh, a seismic hazard assessment of the site, taking into account this seismotectonic uh, model. You have to take into account uncertainties and so on. And you also have to be looking for capable faults uh, near the plan and the plan surrounding. And uh, there are some uh, criteria there. And some criteria can be exclusive. So you cannot put a plan on top of an active fault or near a very active fault. So at the end, the decision is you may install the plan or not. So the seismic uh, aspect can be exclusive. It can be simply you can. When you can, then the, 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 th the thing is it is easier or it is difficult. You may have to engineer a lot and to develop a lot of protections and to develop a lot, to have a stronger uh, seismic design. In other words, in simple, plain words, to put more concrete. So this make, because this is important, this may uh, change the decision from putting a plant in this area to putting the plant in, in some other area. What happens is that uh, in several countries you have no choice, because uh, the, no choice in the sense that uh, there is not something like a low uh, seismic area here and a, and, a, and a high seismic area there. All of them are relatively high seismic areas as it is uh, the, the, the case in, uh, in Japan. So, but uh, seismic analysis is a must and is an exclusive criteria. So in, in for this uh, site evaluation or siting, we have uh, mm, two associated safety guides. One is, one is new, the one on the left, SSG9, seismic siting evaluation of nuclear power plants. And uh, just to give you an idea, uh, the recommendations to meet the requirements that are there is about those aspects that uh, um, we mentioned before, and it starts by a collection 
of uh, information that it is necessary for analysis from any point of views, seismological, geotechnical, and so on. Then you have to develop these uh, seismotectonic uh, models, de defining and characterizing the, the seismic sources, have to analyze the, the ground motion and how this affects and propagates depending on the nature of the soil between the capable faults in the planet and so on. And there is a probabilistic uh, assessment and deterministic hazard assessment. Analyze also potential for fault displacement <coughs> and so on. And at the end of this thing, you get two inputs. One, the plan is suitable. Second, I mean, if it's not suitable, then you can take this, uh, this side. Second, it gives you in the design ground motion. In other words, uh, as a main topic, top result without details, it gives you the input for the design. It's going to give you what is the, uh, the peak ground acceleration and other aspects that you need to take into account to design your plan. Then when you design your plan, then you will define, you, establish, you, uh, you will establish the seismic uh, categorization and you will have to design for which level of earthquakes you design this or what equipment of the plan and what you will not be uh, seismically qualified. And there are rules for that. But the site evaluation gives you the input for the design. So that's really important. So now we come to the design. And we go to SSR 2 slash 1 that you have heard several times. And uh, related to seismic, we have also there two safety ones. One is for the seismic design and qualification of an MPP. And then we have another one which is not for the design, but equally associated to design because you say what you do when you have a plan that is already designed. But for whatever reason, your knowledge has changed and, uh, about the seismic condition in the plant and so on. This happens. And the, the site needs to be reevaluated constantly. And we have learned also that uh, uh, plants have been designed according to previous standards. So we have a safety guide for evaluation of the seismic design of uh, an existing nuclear power plant. It can be used, for instance, also for periodic safety review for refurbishing the plant. Um, and in these guides, uh, you will find recommendations about uh, seismic analysis. I'm going to bring up here, without going into the details, two kinds of uh, seismic uh, analysis, seismic evaluation, the deterministic approaches. And here we have two well-known methodologies. One is by EPRI, it's called the, the, the seismic margin assessment. <coughs> uh, IEA, apart from the, the recommendations in this safety guide, has also developed a safety report. I forgot now the, the number related to this uh, methodology. but. This is a conservative uh, uh, deterministic uh, analysis of margins to failure to uh, evaluate what is the, the capacity of the different components and structures of the, of the plant. And it is uh, based on defining what is called a success path for, uh, uh, for safety systems. Saying, if I have this earthquake, uh, I know that if this system and this system and this and this doesn't fail, I will be able to safe shut down the plan. So I establish what are success paths. And then in these success paths, there are some equipment that are more stronger than others. And what is less strong is what is called a, um, a weak link. And so in this manner, you make an evaluation of the capacity of the plan. Uh, there is something, another methodology for uh, margin assessment, a bit different from, uh, from the NRC. Well, there is a fragility analysis approach for this capacity assessment, and they use some uh, simplified fault tree approach for dealing with, uh, with the system analysis. And then, of course, you have a, a full scope analysis, uh, uh, focus scope, reduced scope. There are some variations depending on, the, on of, of course, on, on the case, because also depends, you know, on the on the location of the plan and so on. And, and, and everything has associated, of course, cost and, and effort. That's the idea of uh, the, the, the methodology. Here there are some uh, uh, principal elements of, uh, of seismic mar margin assessment. So first, you have to identify, because the, it's very important, this concept I mentioned, success path. What are you, how are you going to shut down the plan? So you define sometimes primary and alternate success path. 
and then uh, you define with them, establish what is the seismic equipment list from this access pass because there is the equipment that you need to, to, to protect against the earthquake. Uh, this is also done, uh, taking into account uh, plug down, plan wall downs, where you uh, look at uh, aspects like you know, the, the, the anchoring and uh, of the equipment and potential for uh, impact of uh, shaking or uh, breaking from structure and so on. Uh, and at the end, the point is that uh, you have to define this uh, this uh, success path and see there what is the the, the call this mean max minimum component capacity in the strongest success path. In other words, uh, the, the thing which is the weakest in a success path, it is the limit of the design because this is the equipment that is supposed to be failed first. So uh, the result of this uh, analysis uh, brings you to a screen components that uh, maybe not necessary to seismically qualify from separate from those that are necessary to, to seismically qualify and gives you, uh, provides you a value taking into account the margins for the equipment of what is called hick lift, this high confidence, low probability of failure. So this is a level of earthquake for which you can say with a high confidence that very likely is not going to fail. And this you get for one compo for each component and you also try to get uh, what is the, the this value for the whole uh, plan, and this is like an, a, an estimate of the margin that you have about the, the design input. Now, there are also some uh, probabilistic approach that uh, I don't know if uh, someone is going to explain also, because I'm not sure about the program when it comes PSA and DSA here, but uh, also in the seismic domain, in the, excuse me, in the probabilistic domain of safety analysis there, there's a uh, there, um, it involves some uh, analysis of the event and fault trees, but uh, there is also some simplifications because uh, doing a full seismic PSA is something uh, very expensive and uh, is done in, in a few occasions. But the goal of the probabilistic uh, uh, seismic evaluation is at the end to obtain uh, an estimate of the core damage frequency due to uh, or induced by seismic uh, failures, by, by induced by earthquakes. And if you go to the level 2 PSA to get an estimate of the frequency of a large or early releases. Normally, these results are associated with uh, quite noticeable uh, uncertainties. Now, I'm going to go to more practical and things to learn and so on, to, uh, because this is not really my territory, and uh, and I also don't know your major interest, and I don't think that maybe we can engage into the details of the seismic uh, uh, margin assessment and so on. But the, the, the step, as maybe before going into this, as in similar to the to the internal hazard, the first will be to estimate what is called the seismic hazard curve. If you don't want to seismic, it could be tsunami hazard curve or whatsoever. To have a relation between frequency of a hazard and magnitude. Normally, the, the stronger the hazard, the lower the magnitude. But this gives you a, a, a curve. Frequency versus magnitude. Now that you have this magnitude and you have designed for a given level of hazard or earthquake, now you have the fragility assessment that will be for the different magnitudes which damage you can cause on the plant. This is done, this fragility uh, assessment. And then will be the analysis of the safe shutdown of the plant, taking into account what has failed and what has not failed. For the design, you have to make sure that you are, going on, you are not going to be failing the equipment. Huh? necessary. The probabilistic domain, you take into account the things can indeed fail or other equipment, even not affected by the, by the hazard, can still fail through random failures or other failures, and you come up to the probability. This, work, this works in general, let's put, let's say, the three steps that maybe go in line with internal hazards. I'm going now to talk about some earthquakes or tsunamis that uh, has happened in the recent, recent less decades time mostly in Japan, and we may have learned from them, and also it's nice to understand also that that these events indeed happen, 
and that they are important. And they also don't sometimes they show us what happens, what doesn't happen, that we really sometimes the, the, the seismic design provide margins, but they are the tip topics that are maybe relevant. Let me start. This is the talk of a friend, of a colleague in the division. He's called Michelangelo. <laughs> okay. He's smart, <laughs> doc. <laughs> and he gave me some of the slides, so I put uh, his dog. I didn't put his picture, I put the picture of his dog. Um, Nuka power plants that have been affected by strong earthquakes. Uh, I don't remember very well all this Japanese name, but this is an earthquake in 2005, 10 years ago, called Mi Miyagi, Miyagi, Miyagi Oki plant, nevertheless. It is on the east coast of Japan, not, oh, this is the mouse, not the pointer, <laughs> not very far away from the, where we have uh, Fukushima is here, here we have Sengai Peninsula, here is on Nagawa, so it's close to Nagawa there. The earthquake of Fukushima was in this area. Actually, the, the closest was, uh, place was on Nagawa. So if you see, this is, by the way, a system called Sheikas that we have at the IEA that gives us an idea of depending on the, on the force of the earthquake, the magnitude, what is the potential impact on nuclear installations, and so on. So we have uh, an idea. It is not, sometimes, it's not the most important, not, not the nuclear power plants themselves, because they have a strong design, but uh, uh, we also have research reactors, their sources, and so on, and their equipment that, you know, are not built in the, in the, in this such a strong con concrete structures, and it can be relevant from the point of view of emergency coordination for IEA. So we have this system called SHECAS, and we have this uh, information provi be provided. Uh, there is an on-call shift. They put me on that shift uh, in case something happens to make a previous screen and then to notify those who know. <laughs> um, this earthquake, uh, here you have a magnitude or uh, an indication on when it happened and so on, and what was the situation of the plan. Uh, the plans on Agawa, the three units were in operation and they were shut down automatically by the seismic instrumentation. And this shows you the shutdown period, so some of them went over one year. And uh, this tells you that even if safety, let's say, is not compromised, this leads to uh, important loss of production. And uh, normally in seismic design, you have two levels of earthquake. Sometimes they call uh, level one, level two, but maybe other people put the design basis earthquake and uh, operation basis earthquake and so on. So the ultimate safety systems and so on are designed for the to withstand design basis earthquake. But if you have an earthquake that uh, exceeds the level one, the operation based earthquake, then before you restart the plan, you need to do an evaluation and an inspection of uh, the plan and all the equipment to see what has been impacted. And this leads you to sometimes to important shutdown periods. So this one earthquake. Another one on the other side of Japan. We have a lot of history from Japan and important information. Uh, and there are a lot of nuclear power plants along the coast. So we have another one here that affect uh, this uh, Kashiwasaki, Kariba, Mama, and a uh, number of plants again. Uh, you have here the same uh, evaluation. Here those plants were already shut down for periodical outage. Uh, more earthquakes also close to the shore there and uh, distance to the, because you know, you have, of course, <laughs> the impact there is, is closer, but also the earthquake can propagate and can be noticed even at the, at the west coast. Yeah? It's not something to, to be neglected. That is why Fukushima is also uh, mentioned in this, uh, in this picture. So here you have, uh, again, the same type of, uh, of information, what was the status of the, of the different, different plants. And you also see that, uh, in some cases, it has led to a substantial loss of uh, production in, in shutdown periods to analyze the impact on the, on the plant. Um, here we have Hamaoka. Hamaoka, by the way, is uh, a, a place also um, 
close to important uh, uh, tectonic faults in the sea, which they are now thinking because there is always a recurrent species of earthquake and so on. They are now in around Hamaoka, uh, Hamaoka is shut down, developing a tsunami wall of uh, initially was 20 meters high, they even increased it even more. A massive structure, concrete, thick, tall structure, in case a tsunami will hit the plant, will not go over the, over the wall, and then if it goes, because they always think it can go, now also the buildings have a tsunami walls, not only a wall that it is watertight, but the second wall outside that is going to take the heat. And uh, this is impressive, I've been there on the visit. Now here we have the same uh, kind of, uh, of, of information. Here, by the way, in Hamauka, this is one place where they are uh, constructing one of the new generations of uh, advanced uh, boiling water reactors. It's in construction there. And uh, now I go to one important earthquake that happened also like 10 years ago. Not 10 years ago, I, I don't know, it was in 2007, I'm not sure, I was, you know. This is one that on uh, Kashiwasaki Karibanuka power plant. It happened, what was 2007? Exactly. So this was a, this was a, an earthquake of a very, very high magnitude. This is the, the Japanese scale, but this is the highest category, um, category range. And uh, it hit uh, during a, a holiday at the plant. Also happened that the plant was understaffed because of the national holiday in the morning. And uh, it was uh, <coughs> very close to the plant, and it was very strong. And this is the biggest nuclear power plant in the world. It was a very strong earthquake that, uh, of course, triggered the <laughs> shutdown of the plant automatically. And it caused a number of uh, failures, and it caused also fires. And uh, fires is something that you have to take care of them immediately, because if you don't, if you just concentrate in shutting down the plant, the fire goes on and continues, and uh, it can cause more failures, and you don't even know if the fire suppression systems will work properly after the earthquake. So there was this uh, transformer failures, fires, where you see big transformers. Sometimes uh, transformers of this size have something like uh, 40 cubic meters of oil or so, around this magnitude and so on. So they can create a very heavy fire that can take really to, <coughs> to attempt to stop. This one actually is just, uh, didn't take that long. This picture is interesting. This is the Spainfield pool, and there is some surveillance cameras in these areas, also because of safeguards. Can you see on the left side <coughs> the pool in normal operation, and you see what is called now the sloshing of the pool. The earthquake starts shaking, and the water moves. And also the fuel, well, the, everything moves, yeah? the whole building moves. But the structure of the rackings of the fuel has to be able to withstand the, the seismic force. The point here is this sloshing, and we come to the flooding, what was something else before. We have here a schematic picture of the Spain fuel pool building. This is radiological contracted area because, of course, we have the fuel there. <coughs> and the building next to our areas next to this is not controlled radiological area. The water jump up from the pool because of this sloshing, spread, and went into some pit, something they are related to the refuel machine, some power boss. In here, there's a penetration. This penetration is not designed for water tightness. It's a cable penetration. It's designed with other characteristics. And maybe it will have retained also the water. You don't know, never know. But the point always is after the plant shakes, you get cracks. And penetrations can be also influenced. And you cannot always ensure water tightness. And you don't know. And actually, if you look about uh, Fukushima, and when the people were putting water in the reactor, and it was getting in the 
in the turbine building, this was a feed and leak. You still don't know how it went there. Of course, the reactor uh, was uh, broken and the containment was broken. But how the water goes into the turbine building. But the point is the water finds the way. You put water in the soil, the water will find the gaps. If you are not sure there is a gap there, I don't know if it can be or not. You put water, you find out. So the water found the path through this penetration and exit the control, radiological control area and then found the way and you know and there was a spill there in this floor and another floor you know eventually goes into the sump and into the sump you have some places to collect water for whatever is leaks or cleaning or something like this but this is not the radiological control area and you don't expect to have dirty or radiological contaminated fluids there so then you have a pump and it goes up probably have a, a level meter or something goes up, it was pumped out to the sea. So you see something can happen. It's interesting to know, but this also is, you know, remind that uh, the earthquake can always trigger some of the side effects. And I think this is a good uh, picture to see also that, that flooding takes opportunity of every propagation path. Well, uh, if you take into account the overall performance of the plant, you can see that uh, in spite of this very strong earthquake and movement uh, that exceed the design basis of the plant, uh, there was a satisfactory plant behavior during and after the earthquake. <coughs> and fundamental safety functions were preserved. And there were only very small and significant releases. I mean, that thing... It's not the last release, no. nothing to do with something associated to core damage. Uh, that's the basis here. The design basis is S2. We have these two levels of earthquake. This is the, the safe shutdown earthquake, the, the, the design basis earthquake, so-called. It was largely exceeded. And this is where it tells you that uh, you have, with such means, you have margins. Hmm? Uh, with the flooding, it's not... It may be easier to say, okay, I have this equipment here and the connections are there. And yes, I have to design for this level of water. And I put a centimeter more and I wet it and that's it and this equipment failed. With the earthquake, it's not like that. With the earthquake, if you design for 0.3 G, doesn't mean that if you have uh, 0.31 it fails or even 0.4 it fails. It doesn't. Yeah. Because at the end, you take your input uh, for the use of the design codes, and the design codes uh, include margins. And you don't know what is the margin for the overall plan without estimation and so on, but, uh, but the margins are there. And of course, when you, when you have an earthquake, you see where there was a margin and where there was not, and, and damage uh, occurred. So, uh, well, of course, we can say is the, the <laughs> after the evidence of the earthquake is the the seismic uh, design basis earthquake was underestimated and it was underestimated because the the, the seismic hazard curve was uh, was uh, was underestimated but then this was compensated for what I mentioned the conservative that you introduce in the in the seismic design so at the end uh, there was not a, 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 a safety problem for the plant. Now, there was not a loss of offside power because uh, still maintained two uh, lines fully available, something that uh, didn't happen in Fukushima, for instance. And then uh, what other effects there were effects on the, <coughs> on the soil. There have been roads <laughs> like this crack and something. But uh, and there was, uh, but not uh, in safety significant building. The fire protection piping failed, and uh, this led to water and soil intrusion in reactor building number one. So you see here the side effects. You can create a uh, you can create a fire, and you can create a pipe break, and you can see yourself in a situation with an earthquake, a fire, and maybe not water to uh, put out uh, the the fire. Oil leaks in several transformers, in one of them create a fire, and then you have to mention firefighting, but you lost the fire water sources. 
So what they had to do is to call in outside the brigade. They had to come with the uh, fire trucks from outside. So this is a lesson learned. Yeah? We always have in mind, we know, because this is no, we, we didn't discover anything. It was known that the earthquake can trigger a fire and can break pipes, particularly those that are not seismically uh, designed. Maybe the, the fire water protection system was not seismically designed. From my experience in Spain, uh, I left Spain now, of course, uh, 14 years ago. But there, we only have one plan where the fire protection, fire water protection system is seismically qualified. The others not, and I don't think this is the, the only only country in the world where this happens. So, so if you have an earthquake and your fire water protection system is not seismically qualified. It depends on the margins. It depends on the magnitude of the earthquake and what are really the margins of this system not seismically qualified. So people knew about those things, but now the reality showed them that we knew before it happened. So they lost, uh, they had a break of this, they had a fire, and they didn't have a fire water protection system. Now, of course, uh, they know and they uh, learned the lesson. Um, here, there are some uh, um, uh, aspects that happen in the earthquake, seismic interactions, uh, effects on the control room, ceilings of the control room falling. I have seen this also in, uh, in Onagawa and it was in Fukushima. Uh, these are aspects to take into account because you can also impact the operators or the ability of the control room to be uh, available for uh, operation after that. There were uh, some uh, break of platforms on top of the spent fuel pool, and also something that can happen sometimes there are these flexible connections in between the, the condenser and the circulation water system. So sometimes these rubber connections can, can fail. And also, actually, by the way, if a fire would go in this area, it's also an area where uh, a fire can induce a flood. It happens in Spain in Van de Jos 1. There was a turbine missile, hydrogen uh, fire, and so on. Then eventually the oil uh, burned. And the burning of the oil pouring down in the turbine hole affect this connection and induce a very important flooding. They almost uh, flooded everything. So, so this is another example of uh, interaction between one hazard and another. So there were also the all the findings of what happened. Uh, but the, 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 the reactors uh, could be controlled and radiative uh, releases were, were minimal. Uh, well, some lessons learned from the, the, from the earthquake. And the first thing is that uh, the Japanese, they developed a so-called uh, basic integrity assessment uh, policy. Uh, to assess the integrity of MP uh, MPP structures, system components, they were developed and they were using uh, uh, East, and uh, they developed use made a com based on the combination of inspection and analysis. There's something they did without uh, international standards of, of guidance to how to do this uh, assessment policy when the, when the stream event exceeded uh, significantly the um, the design basis is something that they have shared with the rest of the people. So learn, of course, I mentioned before, if not learn, really realize that an earthquake can induce fires and other events. Okay. Um, so, and this now, of course, it tells us that seismically induced fires need to be taken into account in the design of the fire protection system, the fire water protection system. You can also have to take into account, not only for the design of the fire protection system, but for the fire protection program, to take into account what, in this situation, what you can do. And uh, as a result, now the plan has a fire brigade permanently at the site. I know some countries, they do have, some they don't. But now in Japan, there is a permanent fire brigade at the site. Don't need to call from a fire brigade from, from outside. So now I want to come into the, to the other big earthquake, the, to the one that you know of uh, 2011, 11 of March.
So the time there, around 2 p.m., early in the morning here, magnitude around 9. Uh, this is interim value, uh, and it was the largest uh, earthquake recorded in Japan. And actually, said the, the earthquake, but it was not a single earthquake. There was a series of earthquakes that also took place over different days. Yeah? Something not to forget. And it covered a large region. You will see we have a, um, a picture now following. But uh, to give you an idea, the island of Japan moved, in average, 50 meters east after all these earthquakes. And it was deepened on the, on the east part one meter. So I've been there in some places, and there are some uh, piers, like the one you see here outside, and you go to the sea, and you see now they are covered by water. When people before have a, have a boat, they still have the boat, but sometimes the, the water goes over the pier. Uh, something uh, difficult to imagine, but that the country has moved 50 meters, and so in deep, but it, it's true. So I do not have to control my time. What, when do we have to finish? One? Or 12.30. 12 OK. So I maybe don't need to go into the <coughs> very many details, but the, uh, <coughs> the important thing to say from this picture is that there was not one earthquake. There were several earthquakes in several regions, but of course related to the, 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 to the same tectonic plates. And they were not breaking at the same time. No? But there were very important earthquakes in which one, <coughs> one plate was subducing inside the other. And this is actually what it gives rise to the this displacement, what it gives rise to the, to the, to the tsunami. And these were several uh, breaks. I have another maybe picture, less technical and so on. But that's, of course, a model. And create different sources of tsunami and different tsunami waves of different magnitude. And the impact on the plant resulted differently. Uh, this is uh, Onagawa is there, and Fukushima, Daiichi, Daini are there, and so on. It affected very many, almost 400 kilometers along the coast of Japan. And was a matter of not only distance, but also sometimes the super, superposition of the waves. Because it depends on the phases. Sometimes one wave adds to the other and builds up more. So this is, for instance, the reason that uh, Fukushima Daini was, the flooding was limited. And they were able to keep uh, one power supply that one was used for the units and so on. In the Ichi, they were not so lucky. They were lucky if you saw with, we call lucky with the units five and six. Yeah? But uh, it was a series of earthquakes and a series of tsunamis. And the overall impact is driven by time and coincidence of the tsunami waves and so on. That's uh, a picture around, uh, this is the Fukushima Daiichi site, units one, three, and four. Units six and five are here, a bit higher. And this is a picture of an estimate of the altitude of the different waves and so on, and whether they, they, they went of the small tsunami protection and so on. And, and here maybe it's another one taking into account uh, from the level of the sea, the tide above, and the, here they have the, the, the service water or the intake water. And then the, the grade of the plant, the excavation level of the plant was 13 meters above uh, for units one to four, but not sufficient. This is a service built turbine building, reactor building. You probably has seen many pictures of them. Uh, these are plant levels uh, above the, the sea in different uh, plants. And you have here Fukushima Daiichi, 13 meters, unit four, 10 meters, 13 and Daini 12, and Onagawa 14.8. So they are not very different. Onagawa is a bit higher, you must realize. But sometimes when it comes here, it was also a matter of luck or coincidence of wave or something. There are many factors. It's not something that you know is the wave. It also depends on the waves inside the plant, the circumstances. But 
Uh, these are pictures from a mission uh, <coughs> we conducted to Onagawa. When you, of course, we cannot go to Fukushima, see what happened. Uh, and even if you go there, you will not now be able, because you cannot go there, of course, of the terrible conditions that you to, will you be exposed. But uh, it's not easy to make a forensic analysis and now say this was caused by the earthquake, this was caused by the tsunami, and this was caused by this uh, uh, hydrogen explosion. You only see destruction, you cannot see. But Onagawa survived. And Onagawa shut down. Yeah? It is very good to see what the impact of the earthquake and the tsunami was there. To the stand, it was hit, but it was hit by the. And this was, by the way, the plant that it was closest to the earthquake. And we had a mission. Uh, uh, we went there. I participated in this uh, in this mission as part of the system analysis team. So we were uh, looking at several aspects on structures and, 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 and systems. So the plant uh, uh, was operating at the time of the of the um, earthquake and tsunami. There was one unit that was uh, starting up, but they were not the same. The status was not the same, but the plant was in operation. And the power cabinets and the power buses and so on was uh, was um, energized. So uh, the basis for assuming the operability of the plant after the earthquake is that all the sujiers were reported to be undamaged and operable. And uh, but of course uh, we make our visit, our analysis, our discussions. After that, they have. Uh, uh, there was a, the, the protections of, all, of some uh, equipment has been triggered, and some uh, equipment is the energized or is energized. We cannot energize the equipment to see if there has been damage or not. So part of the of the conclusions are made by analysis, by inspection, and so on. They, they have been they were doing. They share some uh, results with that. Uh, we went to, for some wall downs. Uh, of course, they are not waiting. We were not waiting for the IA. They have been also doing uh, doing uh, repairs. But it is impressive uh, to see the little impact sometimes, in spite of the magnitude of the earthquake in, in structures, in walls, uh, even in things like the turbine. They have an impact on on on, on anchoring of the turbine on the on the turbine blades. By the way, by the way, uh, I think. Uh, I'm not very photogenic, and the guy there, and the guy there. Uh, so we were visiting some of the of the systems uh, at at the plant. This is the instrumentation of the vessel from from underneath. Uh, this RC RCAC uh, equipment uh, that it is what uh, <coughs> you use to cool the isolated uh, core. It is a steam driven system. It's equivalent to auxiliary water and pressurized water reactor. And this is what was running for uh, most of the time in the Fukushima Daiichi uh, one, because it doesn't need a power supply. It only needs DC power until eventually disappear. Uh, in, uh, and even in some units in Fukushima Daiichi, in when going without DC power for, for a while, the unit one is the one that doesn't have RCS, it has isolation condenser. Anyway, uh, we have a, a very uh, interesting uh, findings there and, uh, and discussions. And uh, as I said, this is like a good, like a good lab for uh, seeing uh, what has happened in the, in the whole area. And uh, it's interesting to know that uh, this plan, because the strong positions there of the, uh, some engineers was designed to a higher level of uh, of tsunami. This uh, certainly saved the the, the, the plant. And uh, <coughs> now, of course, they are even uh, uh, taking into account further steps to 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 enlarge the, the protections. They are constructing three meters above and uh, reinforcing also some of the some of the buildings. Uh, the motions that were observed there at the, on the base mat were close to the response of the uh, beyond design basis ground mode acceleration. However, uh, so, so 
So there were some uh, 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 motions there that they were about the, the, the design basis. I'm going to show you something about the tsunami. Uh, this was one uh, 30 meters. It was not reached by the planet. I have some pictures here. Uh, the tsunami hazard uh, on all these several sites in the coast of Japan was uh, underestimated for a number of reasons. Uh, there was not uh, also taken into account in several opportunities that they have for the for the revision of the seismic design and also the, the um, uh, design against tsunamis. Probably all of you have seen this picture where there has some road in some village marking the water came up here 100 years ago. Uh, if almost some of you have had the opportunity of, of seeing the, the report of the IEA uh, on the Fukushima accident, if it has not been changed, I was reviewing this report last year ago. It's interesting to know when you see the, the siting analysis in the design of Fukushima, the Ichi Nuka power plant, you look there for the external hazards. And there is not in the original report, there was tsunami was not there explicitly. Tsunami was there, but was inside the analysis of tidal waves that may happen. And the tsunami that was uh, considered for the design was uh, a tsunami from a large earthquake that took place in uh, Chile and propagated across the Pacific and reached an altitude of 3.12 meters in the coast of Japan, a nice wave for surfing. So this is what it was considered for the, surprisingly for the for the design at, uh, at uh, Fukushima, originally, Fukushima Daiichi. And if you have seen the picture of Fukushima Daiichi, you will also see that uh, the elevation of the soil near the coast is higher, so they excavate down the plant to save probably in uh, pumping cost and so on. So they lower the soil to be closer to the sea, and they went too far down. And there were several opportunities to uh, make some improvements, put some tsunami walls protections to reconsider the situation, but these opportunities were uh, were not uh, not not uh, taken. Uh, one thing here interesting is to mention is when this um, accident that took place uh, in Kashiwazaki, Kariba before they understood in Japan the importance of having emergency response centers on site. And this was installed at several plants in the Japan, including Fukushima. So in Fukushima, up in the hill, there was an emergency response center or facility. Now it's required in our requirements of the IE is required. And this is the place where people was able to, I would not say to rest, because people didn't sleep for days after the accident, but it was the only place where people could stay safely at the plant and be able to be there. Because if they would have not had this, uh, this uh, facility at the plant, simply the whole plant site would have been destroyed and people could have no place to rest, no place to hide, no place to have nothing at the plant for responding. So this was a lesson that uh, that was uh, that was learned from a previous case, and uh, it was in place at uh, at Fukushima. And this is the place from now, of course, when uh, there is uh, some civil accident uh, condition. It is the the place where you have all the technical logistic support for the operating crew. The place can be activated before that you don't need to be waiting to be waiting for a civil accident, but it is there for the case of it. Um, so the lessons about hydrogen risk, of course, yeah. and emergency uh, arranging arrangement. Okay, uh, this is the conclusion. So, um, so 
maybe to say again that uh, even this earthquake exceeds the design basis of many of the plants there in the East Coast, that the earthquake itself was not the big problem. The, 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 the failures or the damages that uh, were experienced at all these units, we cannot speak for Fukushima because we cannot go there, but it was very limited. So the, the seismic uh, design was robust and the margins were, were sufficient. The earthquake was underestimated, but uh, the margins provided for uh, ensuring the safety functions. The problem was the tsunami. When the tsunami submerged the plant, then the, the safety functions could not be ensured. This is what basically I say. Okay, so now, of course, it is very difficult. You cannot say in Fukushima anything about what, what happens or, or what caused what. There are some uh, people, scientists or different uh, people that, that claim that uh, the evolution in Fukushima 1, the fast cooling and so on, was the result of a potential local. Uh, or they say that this is the, was the isolation condenser. This has not been uh, verified. Now it's not possible to see if the damage there are from the earthquake, the tsunami, the hydrogen explosions, the helicopter drop of water, and, and, and so on. So maybe the earthquake indeed has some impact in Fukushima, but it is not uh, possible to know what is the impact on, the, on that plan. In Onagawa, uh, we provide a very long report from this, uh, from this mission, and uh, it was uh, impressive. Uh, the design of the plan regarding earthquake, seeing the damage, uh, was really impressive. Uh, now, of course, what is important to learn is the, the, the seismic hazard evaluation. One has to be uh, being very careful not to underestimate and rely uh, recently on simply on historical data, on data that it is seismologically uh, recorded. Uh, there has to be uh, further analysis of the soil uh, in, in the neighboring areas to be able to understand that uh, the hazard is uh, properly characterized and the magnitude is, is uh, properly established for, for, for the design. Uh, something about uh, the, the tsunami that, of course, was, uh, was uh, as I said, uh, for very several reasons underestimated. Uh, the tsunami warning. Now it has been clear how important is tsunami warning. Of course, Tsunami warning saves people, but not really saves the plant. Can save it partially. So when the tsunami warning is given and it is a real warning, the tsunami will arrive. And if the plant is going to be flooded, it will be flooded. But depending from where is the tsunami coming and the magnitude, you may buy some time. So uh, this may allow to initiate a fast shut down of the plan, try to do some actions, I mean, in case the plan is not properly designed, yeah, to facilitate the later management of the accident. And, uh, you know, this could have, uh, of course, have some impact in, in, in Fukushima. But in Fukushima, surprisingly, even after this uh, tsunami that happens in uh, Thailand, in the, that region, there was no warning of tsunami at the plan. And it, uh, uh, the people that was in the, this technical support center or the, the, in the maintenance center, when I had one colleague of the IEA that was working there, who was working with us, now he was the head of maintenance at the plant. And uh, when they asked, were the first movements of the earthquake, very strong earthquake came, they went out of the building, they realized nobody had been hurt and so on. And later on, they found through the TV that uh, a tsunami was coming later on. But the operators uh, didn't know. 
so there was no uh, alert into operators. In fact, this is one of the reasons because some of the some people were were sent ne next to the sea to the to inspect uh, the intake structure, the service water, and so on. Some people died. So now um, there's going to be an alert for the operator. But as I said, the, the alert does not protect the plant. It gives you some time. It gives you some. Uh, opportunity to influence the, the, the outcome or the impact, but not, not really uh, to prevent uh, many, many failures. Um, also important that is learned is to take into account not only the, the, the tsunami, but what we said at the beginning, the run up, because it's not only the level of the tsunami, it's also the possibility, the dynamic force and how higher the tsunami can go and what is the the the, the destruction on the on the plan. The there's a need to use a systematic approach for dealing with the design of the nuclear power plant and the as is there for prevention against uh, tsunami. So now many as you know the plants in Japan most of them are shut down. There are some that are now reconsidering going in the process of a uh, um, uh, being authorized to, to restart. But what you see there in the buildings, I have seen this in Hamaoka, I have seen this in, in Onagawa. Now they have, buildings have watertight doors. And before the watertight door, there is a, a massive, sturdy, big, unbelievable, I don't know how to describe door, to take the heat of the potential tsunami. So. In addition to, of course, uh, tsunami walls or increase of the level of uh, the existing uh, protections and so on to make sure that the, that the plant uh, remains, remains dry. Uh, I'm putting here something we saw that happened in Onagawa. It's interesting. Uh, this, this is the tsunami effect. So this is the, the, the sea. The estimated uh, uh, tsunami could go up to 9.1 meters. Tsunami went higher. But the tsunami wall in this plant was designed with more margins than, than others. As I mentioned before, tsunami was not able to go over the wall. So the tsunami was not able to flood the plant. What happened is that the tsunami went into a structure for the intake of water. And there, there were the seawater pumps. And there were some ultrasonic level transmitters. And the water came here with a lot of force and pulled this up. These were the original transmitters. Now, this is the way it is now. Now it is it's, it's sealed. But now, where they have the transmitter, they have something like this. So to make sure that the tsunami will never lift this up. The result was that uh, the water entering this space, there was train A, train B. There were uh, doors as sturdy as this one. I, I don't, didn't put the detail of the doors there. But these are kind of submarine doors. It's not that you close, and then there is a wheel. And the door is as thick as this. And they have rubber joints and so on. These are supposed to be able to hold the water, not to let it propagate between one division and another. So the water came here went into this tunnel, let me see here. There's some cable penetration there. They can bring the power to these pumps and so on. And there, at the door, at the wall, they found the way. The water, I tell you, finds every path. And he went into some gallery there, and he flooded the building. And uh, they took us to this building for pictures with the press and everything and so on, the way they have sale. And in this building, they have three redundancies, marking colors. And the water came up from uh, from this side somewhere. It's not easy to see here now because the, 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 let me see. Uh, yeah, the water came here from, from this gallery, from this way, so here. And the water entered there. And these doors that you see here are of this size. This is with the big one for moving the equipment. This is the small one that you open to cross. This is me, by the way, again. And, uh, and they make us the point, because there was a very fast uh, 
transfer of water from one to another side, and they flood this redundancy, and they flood this redundancy, and this one uh, was not able to flood until there was just one meter, and they installed some pumping system water, and they pump out the water before they lost one redundancy. Unfortunately for them, there was not the residual heat was low because the plant was starting after it shut down. <coughs> but uh, I don't see here, I took from the report, the, the times, but the times for the flooding here don't match. It is unbelievable that the water will penetrate those doors just through the door gaps so quickly, and one door, and another door, and another door. And what happened at the end <coughs> is that those places were connected by the sumps. The sumps were connected, so there was a path there. There was a pipe penetrating there, so this, uh, this door didn't help because the pipe was penetrating the wall, now it's sealed. There was another penetration there in the wall. There was a cable penetration there that went from there to there and so on. So the water found out all the paths. And they believe that they have three redundancies separated and protected against flooding. And they, they, they didn't. And, and this tsunami didn't exceed the wall there, but in this unit found this path to this. And uh, they were lucky uh, because something more serious could, can, could have happened. So you have to understand what is also the importance, I mean, to learn from this. It's not only the, the, the earthquake, it's not only the tsunami. You have to understand all these things, all these propagations. So, Flood protection looks like easy, but uh, very careful that all the communication path has to be taken into account. Okay. Well, this is about tsunami warning, of course, depending what is the what is the the, the, the origin of the tsunami, what is the seismic, the origin of the you have more or less time, but the tsunami warning is, uh, is, uh, is relevant for um, uh, preparing for the tsunami event. Okay. So maybe to recapitulate, lessons learned from the lessons learned. So, you understand. so this lesson from Kashiwasaki Kariba experience was very important for Fukushima because uh, they came up with the importance of this uh, seismically isolated building uh, with uh, ventilation, also filter ventilation uh, at a high elevation and, uh, and, and located at the plant. And this was the point that uh, the people could stay there at Fukushima. Uh, and could be the, actually, this, this building was contaminated uh, partially by the, the visit of some politician that didn't care into taking the necessary the contamination measures to visit the plant. But this was the place where people could reside and stay there for weeks uh, mitigating the accident. And also the, 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 the site brigade was also very important. Although there were not uh, fires in the, in the, at, the, at the plant, the fire was not an issue in, uh, in Fukushima. There were some, uh, fire, some small fires in Onagawa and uh, in a power uh, cabinet and a power bus this mid uh, voltage. He was not, but the fact that they have uh, established uh, a fire water brigade at the plant as a result of Kashiwasaki Kariba, uh, this uh, gave them the opportunity to have some uh, water tanks, uh, more than water tank, fire trucks and something that uh, will facilitate them uh, to provide cooling uh, to several structures. They didn't save the plant, unfortunately. But they have that because if you have an accident like the one in Fukushima, the roads were destroyed, the roads were flooded by the tsunami, Trans transportation had to be many things by helicopter. So uh, having a fire brigade there was a positive thing. And I think I finished before the time. Now I'm uh, ready for, uh, anyway, some questions. Thank you.